everyone, and good evening to our dear panelists. Um, hello to all of you uh, who have joined us uh, here in Glasgow uh, and online. I'm truly honored to welcome you all for this event on the role of public development banks in the implementation of low carbon and resilient pathways. Allow me first to introduce myself and give you some context and my, my perspective uh, of this event. I'm, I am Beryl Bouteille. I am the Secretary General of the IDFC, the International Development Finance Club, which brings together 27 national and regional development banks worldwide. Uh, IDFC was funded in uh, 2011 because of group of PDBs, public development banks, wanted to do more on climate. And over the 10 past year, uh, the IDFC members have been working together to implement the objective of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Yesterday, actually, we celebrated uh, the 10-year anniversary of the club um, on the IDFC pavilion here in Glasgow, alongside the IDFC annual meeting, where the club welcomed a 27th uh, member, the Africa Finance Corporation, and re-elected Agence Française de Développement and its, its CEO, Rémi Rioux, uh, to the presidency of the club for a third term. And this was an opportunity for all of us to take stock of our collective action and cooperation over the 10 past years and on the role of IDFC and beyond the role of public development banks to, in aligning sorry, all financial flows, public and private, with the SDGs and Paris agreements. And that is the objective of the Financing Common Movement that we launched together with the World Federation of DFI in 2019, bringing together uh, the 500 public development banks, um, along with those stakeholders, uh, the governments, uh, the central banks, private sectors, uh, think tanks, uh, civil societies, first to uh, design and implement recovery measures that will have a long-term impact on our societies and our planets, and to reinvent multilateralisms and new form of uh, collaboration um, and cooperation. So the second edition of the Finance in Common Summit took place uh, in Rome uh, last October. And we were all, we were all here <laughs> um, to, to report on the results of uh, this summit and to report on the progress made by the coalition of, of public development banks, including on the climate-related uh, issues uh, such as climate finance, uh, Paris alignment, adaptation, agriculture, gender, biodiversity. Um, so our event will be divided uh, in two parts. Uh, first, uh, a keynote and then a discussion with, with our panelists. So let me introduce first Patrick Lamini. <laughs> Dear Patrick, uh, CEO of uh, the Development uh, Bank of Southern Africa and founding member of uh, IDFC. Patrick, could you please share with us your perspective of the financing common movements uh, for DBSA, of course, and of, on behalf of the IDSC as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, Beryl, and good afternoon. It really gives me a great pleasure to talk here today, representing my chairman, Mr. Remy Ryu, the president of AFD, and the chairman of IDFC. Really, this event today is dedicated to the Finance in Common Movement. Uh, it's been two years since it was started, and I must say that we have achieved great strides uh, with the Finance in Common, because the Secretariat of the Finance in Common uh, hosted us in Rome, uh, which, which actually was kindly and generously hosted by CDB of Italy, as well as IFED, which is the International Fund of agricultural uh, uh, development of Italy, uh, wherein we were able to engage and gather the 530 public development banks all over the world. These are a collective that are responsible for over 2.2 trillion US dollars of annual investments, which equates to about 12% of global investments. You can imagine how much it means and the potential that lies with these 530 public development banks 
as we are here talking about COP26 and how these policy instruments of the states can really play a very critical role in really shifting the needle and shifting the world towards the achievement of the net zero emission by 2050. I'm very also happy to share with you that in our AGM meeting yesterday as IDFC, we made bold statements. We made bold moves in terms of having, in 22 years ago, set our target of, of achieving 1.1 trillion by 2025 of green climate funding. We were able to achieve that. We, as a collective, which then says what we did yesterday, we also agreed as IDFC to then increase our commitment to 1.3, 1.3 trillion US dollars to green climate funding by 2025. It is really a big achievement and a big step for ourselves as public development banks. We all understand what it means in terms of moving towards the net zero emission. But what this also does for us as public development banks, it says we have to be much more innovative and much more creative in making sure that our targets in our own countries and our role in terms of driving catalytic financial instruments to enable and to leverage on the committed 1.3 trillion US dollars by the global finance and, and private businesses here on Tuesday. It says we really can be able to catalyze those capital and we need to make sure that we are able to work with the multilateral development banks to ensure that public development banks, as well as the development banking systems, is really re-looked really at and coming up with different financial incentives that will make sure that the behaviors of public development banks are able to drive us towards the achievement of a net zero uh, emission by 2050. It really is something that says to us we, as we also made the call yesterday, that as, as IDFC, we want to shift towards really moving away from fossil fuel funding and making sure that our transition finance talks about funding the transition, the fair and just transition strategies for our respective countries, as we know that our goal is to make sure that biodiversity, which talks to nature, as well as people. If we are able to make sure that we create an inclusive society and make sure that we are able to drive the SDGs by 2030 and be able to all say we have left no one behind, but then that we are now moving forward in making sure that we create and contribute our part in a greener climate, in a, in a net zero emission by 2050. It really, it is the intention of IDFC to make sure that with our members, we keep on looking at how we can be able to capacitate our municipalities, capacitate our governments, capacitate our countries, capacitate each other to make sure that we have the requisite skill sets we have the requisite financial instruments that will talk to the achievement of the net zero emission by 2050. It is a very tall ask, as these are expected for a lot of the emerging economies, a lot of least developed economies, which says skills and capability and capacity development is going to be extremely important because if we can be able to achieve the reporting as well as the skill sets necessary at municipal level to drive achievements of net zero emission, it will mean that each and every corner of our society will be united in driving the strategy of net zero emission by 2050.
I want to take this opportunity and say to you all again that net zero emission by 2050 is what has got to redefine our behavior and redefine our action and that working together and being led by honest and ethical leadership, we can be able to create a better world for our future generations. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for uh, highlighting um, the critical role of public development banks in supporting decarbonized uh, economies and in financing the just, uh, the just transition. And also to recall uh, our ambitions within the club to mobilize up to 1.3 trillion on, of green and climate finance by 2025 and to end uh, international uh, public finance for new uh, unabated coal uh, power generation abroad by 2021, uh, following the G20 uh, declaration. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And then uh, I will turn to Adama Mariko, um, who is online with us. Uh, Adama is, uh, yes, is uh, uh, the Secretary General of the Financing Common Movement uh, and the Deputy Executive Director for Strategy, Partnerships and Cooperation at, uh, and Communication at uh, Agence Française de Développement. Um, Adama, could you please uh, tell us more about the FIC uh, dynamic uh, and the FIC role uh, within the international financial architecture? And, um, and please also recall us uh, the main outcomes of this uh, second edition uh, of the summit. Uh, thank you very much, Beryl, uh, and thanks to Patrick too. This introduction was uh, really helpful. And I wanted also to uh, take this occasion to congratulate and say uh, happy birthday to IDFC and IDFC members. Uh, it has been 10 years and and you have been leading this uh, initiative to, to finance in common. Uh, what we know uh, today to gather uh, more uh, banks uh, than ever, uh, thanks to, to IDFC leaders too. Um, I also want to thank you and congratulate you for this major announcement uh, that just uh, has been made by Patrick. Uh, it's really bold and, and uh, it was about time. Uh, thank you very much and, uh, and really congratulating to you. And I say hello to all friends connecting, uh, connected or online or, or actually there in Glasgow. Uh, and greetings to you for the success of Finance in Common in, in, in Rome. It was uh, your success, uh, actually. Uh, I will, uh, uh, thanks, Barry, uh, just speak about three points. Uh, you asked about Finance in Common. So, um, who we are uh, as, a, as a finance in common coalition. This will be my first point. The second one, uh, what do we do uh, in finance in common? And the last point uh, I wanted to share with you is the uh, major outcomes we have had uh, in Rome. Uh, uh, so we used to say uh, all, all the ways uh, leads to Rome. Uh, this time it, it leads to Glasgow uh, and this COP uh, because we, we worked there for this COP and, and there were major, major outcomes we can share. Um, first of all, um, let me underline that I, I think the, the title of this event captures uh, pretty well where do we stand today and why the COP26 is important. Um, Patrick said it. Uh, actually, we, we're facing a crisis and the COVID crisis just offered another example of uh, the massive um, and, you know, the vulnerabilities uh, within our economies and our societies. Um, while it's not new, those uh, are, you know, interconnected risks uh, and they have to be uh, faced because they are universal. Uh, they are increasingly adding up uh, one another, impacting other parts of society and ultimately undermine the social coalition, cohesion. Uh, within countries. All these vulnerabilities have something in common. Uh, they, deeply, they are deeply rooted in uh, socio-economic inequalities. Uh, when the consequences of climate change strike, they impact people wherever they are, and in particular in the most vulnerable um, uh, parts, the most vulnerable peoples, uh, which in return can fuel inequalities and instability. Um, in the light of uh, these challenges, public development banks have a key role to play, 
And during the first Financing Command Summit um, in November 2020 here in Paris, all public development banks from all around the world have committed to align their activities within the, with the two, uh, 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable, the sustainable Development, development Goals. Um, it was a bet, it was bold, uh, but we were convinced that uh, these actors have a unique role to play to address the economic and social uh, uh, economic, social, and environmental challenges we are facing, facing. And those challenges have been amplified uh, by the COVID pandemic and to accelerate also the achievement of the SDGs. They also gathered in Rome uh, two weeks ago in that, in that context uh, and the context of the Italian G20 presidency to address issues uh, at the core of the COP26, such as uh, catalyzing public um, and private resources towards sustainable agri-food and agri-food system and uh, food security, adaptation to climate change, biodiversity protection, promotion of gender equality and social inclusion. This shows uh, the huge impact and positive influence the, 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 the public development banks can have in the context of the finance and common, finance in common movement. Public development banks are not just about the funding and the money we brought on table. It's about people. And I had the occasion to say it in Rome. The finance in common is about people. So what do we do concretely? The role uh, of the public development banks are, is even more important as countries currently um, around the world uh, coming coming out of the COVID crisis with a very little fiscal space av available. So global PDBs, which represent an investment of over 2.5 million trillion, sorry, dollars, 2.5 trillion dollars in aggreg aggregated annual outflows. And it's more than 12% of the global investment each year. This is tremendous money we are talking about. So, as such, how public development banks invest the investment and they make impact uh, to people and the planet. This is an important task they have uh, before reaching out the other 90% of, of investment ongoing with the states and the private sector. Just try to use the money we are investing Aligning it with the Paris Agreement is the first task we have. The Finance in Common uh, uh, movement focuses on leveraging this scalable capital, developing opportunities between the public and the private actors, creating pipelines, increasing, the improve, increasing and improving cooperation within the global PDB coalitions including the national and the regional level, connecting them to the international financing system. Public finance can indeed play a critical role in working towards the SDGs and aligning of the, 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 the outflows coming from the banks. Because they operate at the sub-national and the national and the regional level, um, either bilaterally or multilaterally, they have the, uh, the ability to adapt their roles and changing to change the needs and to um, different stages of the development at points at, on time. PDBs are well suited not only to provide contracyclical contra lending, but also to make you know. Um, what just has said, uh, Patrick, is important, is to rebuild, is to rebuild after the crisis and to rebuild better by leaving no one behind. These are the, 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 you know, the major outcomes we had to take and, and the decisions we have to, 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 to roll on. We have made tremendous progresses since last year, the Finance in Common was created in November 2020. Those progress are on climate and by biodiversity within the fixed movement. Just mention a few of them. On climate, 
IDFC has announced to have reached 1 trillion for green and climate projects between 2015, you know, since the COP21, and, and 2020. So Patrick just announced that they are reaching now, you know, and, 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 and uh, moving the target higher to 1.3 trillion. On biodiversity, the setting up of the Development Finance Hub and the Task Force for, for, on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD, is an historic step ahead. And it will bring additional expertise to the, to the TNFD, because now we have PDBs into the coordination of the TNFT. On adaptation, the collaborative, and I think our friend Soren will talk about it later, is a primary vehicle for delivering on the new commitments put forward by the G7, the ICE members. On the gender, the fixed coalition on gender equality and women's empowerment in development banks expanded. We have new members joining forces, working on this program, and all members work together. They discussed measurements on, on, of gender financing and to highlight promising practices to en enhance the relation between climate change and their portfolios. In the Water Coalition, we published recently a, a major document which helped to clear out the way for banks who want to finance their portfolios in the water business. I think also of uh, the Black Sea Trade and Development Bank, uh, and thanks to them inviting us today to discuss this issue of finance in common. We approved a new climate change strategy aiming to achieve a net zero emission by 2050, or CAF, uh, our friends for Latin America, uh, and thanks to the new president too, with the ambition to transform uh, the, the bank uh, as a green bank of Latin America. I am glad that the PEBs and the fixed partners are present today to share in more details of the achievements. So what did we do in Rome and why it is important to keep the movement, keep the momentum? Uh, in Rome, the summit took place the 19th and the 20th of October. So it was hosted by our friends for Car City, Positi and Pestiti, thanks to them, in partnerships, in partnership with uh, IFAD, International Fund for Agriculture Development, under the auspice of the G20 Italian presidency. This second edition has proven fundamental in consolidating the coalition of PDBs that was launched a year ago. It was now the time to transform what we have tried, and it confirmed that the Financing Common Coalition has a, you know, a structural player in the international uh, debate with an, a potential to mobilize climate and sustainable finance for the achievements we are aiming for 2030. Our work in Rome has contributed to advance and enrich the fixed coalition commitments taken in the first edition, with numerous outcomes and practical deliverables. Firstly, we had a political breakthrough because the financing common cooperation with the G20 Italian presidency enabled the summit to be included in the G20 agenda. It allowed also the Financing Common Coalition to be mentioned in the final declaration of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors communique. Besides acknowledging the unique role of PDBs in catalyzing public and private finance for SDGs and the Paris Agreement, the G20 declaration also recognized the fixed coalition as an official counterpart, requesting that the coalition reports its progress on its initiative its progress on its initiative to the next G20 presidency. This represents an important step forward in the recognition of our coalition crucial role within the international financing architecture for sustainable development. The second edition was also an important occasion to create to carry on and consolidate the dialogue between the public development banks and key stakeholders through the PDB's dialogue with 
civil society, governments, donors, philanthropes, the private sector and think tanks, academics, to ensure their involvement in actions and projects. The summit also contributed to better define the role of the PDBs, ensuring a sustainable food system transformation. In this regard, there was also a major breakthrough. And thanks to our friends from IFAD, uh, they, they launched the PDB platform for green and inclusive food system. It will provide technical assistance, sharing of expertise, and tools that will be critical for PDBs to reorient, optimize, and scale up their financing to accelerate greener and more inclusive investment in agriculture. Lastly, during this summit, the coalition has published the first time its, its progress report on the Financing Commons Initiative, showcasing the all advancements on commitments made in the joint declaration signed last year. And as you know, we have 14 coalitions, thematic coalitions, we are, which are making breakthrough and which are be, be, getting more and more bigger uh, because we have new members joining on the, those coalitions. I will finish by saying that the fix is launched now and the dynamic and the dynamic will last. The ambition is high, but it's also reachable. The next edition will be organized next year by European Investment Bank and the African Development Bank and will provide renewed opportunities to report on those progresses achieved by all the public development banks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adama, and congratulations on the second edition of the Financing Common uh, Summit. You've shared with us major outcomes of this second edition on, on climate, on biodiversity, on, on water, uh, on gender, on agriculture, uh, on, on the mobilization of private sector, and uh, we'll now discuss uh, them more in details uh, with our panelists. Um, thank you again, Patrick uh, and Adama, uh, for, for sharing uh, with us uh, your views on, on the Financing in Common Summit. So I will now turn to, to our panelists. Uh, you are all uh, representatives of uh, institutions involved in the Financing in Common movement. And uh, you took part of the second edition of the, of the, of the FIC Summit. Um, so I would like to ask you all the same question, actually. Um, what does it mean? Um, what, the, what does the financing comment movement mean for you, for your institution? Uh, what you, we would like to, to bring to, to, to this movement? And um, what do you take as key outcomes uh, from the, the FIX uh, 2021? And um, I will kindly ask you to, 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 to make short intervention for about five minutes uh, each uh, so, you, so we can have a second round of, of questions. Um, and I will start with you, Ubaldo. 
Ubaldo Elizondo, you are climate coordinator at CAF and colleague of the climate uh, working group of IDFC. So could you tell us um, what are the key outcomes um, uh, that you retain from the summit, uh, especially for CAF uh, and uh, on behalf of the climate working group of IDFC? Thank you very much and good day to everyone, Mr. Lamini. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations to IDFC, of course, for these first 10 years of, of life and to the Financing Common Movement as well for this second edition, which was very successful. We had the participation of our new president, Mr. Sergio Diaz Granados, who started his new mandate in September and was able to participate in this very important event. Um, as you mentioned, CAF has been involved with this movement of uh, financing common through the International Development Finance Club since it, its inception in 2011. Um, one of the first working groups was on climate finance, on climate change, trying to figure out how to work with the new instruments that were uh, coming into the arena, like the Green Climate Fund, trying to show as well that we were positive and, and, and right partners for the mobilization of green and climate finance for our countries. Uh, we had the honor of, or we have the honor of being co-chairs of the Climate Working Group. Uh, the Climate Working Group that has given us the, the possibility of sharing with colleagues from the different uh, financial institutions that are part of IDFC, 27 institutions, as you mentioned, Beryl. Uh, with very different mandates, some of them, them bilateral uh, financing, regional, national development banks from all over the world. And this platform has given us the possibility of sharing knowledge, sharing different ways of doing work, uh, learning from each other, being uh, at the most uh, advanced discussion, such as this COP, uh, and being able to participate with different partners most of the time uh, virtually, but uh, also having the possibility of uh, having in-presence workshops and getting to know our colleagues as well. Um, in 2019, the, the club, the IDFC, make a tremendous push in the right direction with the implementation of a climate facility. As you know, this uh, operational facility uh, gave the possibility also of, to our members to have a platform in which we can share knowledge, but also uh, develop tools to maximize our potential and the knowledge that we have. Also a platform that made it possible to channel funding, not through any of our individual institutions, but as a group, uh, through a partnership that we have with the Green Climate Fund. Uh, we were able to channel readiness resources, reno non-renewable resources to help some of our members in their accreditation to the GCF and the members that were already accredited with their, the implementation of programs and projects with the GCF. So this uh, facility, I think, is, has been one of the main successes of this participation of uh, IDFC. I could mention some other uh, successes that we have had with the facility and the climate working group. We have been able to improve the quality of, uh, of our tracking, and the mapping of green finance uh, with a common methodology that we have not only with IDFC members, but also with the multilateral development banks. We were able to uh, agree to methodologies on mitigation and adaptation finance. Uh, we are working on uh, improving these methodologies as well with the MDBs. We were able to work, as I mentioned, with the Green Climate Fund with this uh, readiness resources and also another work program that we are developing with them. We're also trying to figure uh, out and search new sources of funding from international uh, funds um, or the, uh, sources such as the European Commission in which we can also channel resources for our members and the countries in which we work. And we have a, a very um, important toolbox that we have developed after making a needs assessment with all of our members in which we can 
uh, help them in tools on greenhouse gas accounting, physical clim climate risk assessment, development of climate strategies, alignment to the Paris Agreement, and so on and so forth. Um, I will leave it at that for my first intervention. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ubaldo, and thank you for recording um, the long journey of IDFC on, on climate finance, starting with mapping uh, and then um, uh, defining uh, a common language and common principles with, uh, with, MD, uh, with the MDBs, uh, and uh, finally defining a, a common framework uh, um, to implement a Paris alignment and to operationalize uh, it within uh, the club's uh, uh, institutions. Um, let me now turn to you, <laughs> Competa. Uh, Kompeta Zinzoga, you are the CEO of the Development Bank of uh, Rwanda and you have been very much involved uh, and active on promoting the role of public development bank in the agriculture sector and um, with that um, of the mobilization of the, of the private tech sector. So could you uh, tell us uh, a bit more about uh, these important issues? Uh, thank you very much. I think one of the key messages from the Finance in Common uh, meeting that we had in Rome and I had the pleasure of attending in person is that it's official, PDBs are back. I think especially national public development banks, we've had varied experiences in the past, we've learned our lessons and now we're back. And I think the counter-cyclical nature of the public development banks mean that they are now more important than ever. And before I talk to about agriculture, I also want to link agriculture and climate finance in the same paragraph, if I can say, because we are the only banks that bank on the future. Most banks bank on your track record, bank on the track record of a sector, um, they bank on the past. And public development banks have a very unique mandate where we bank on the future. We bank on what will be needed tomorrow, whether we're looking at the role of the private sector for tomorrow or the role of society as a whole for tomorrow. And that's very important. And that's why um, we have a passion for agriculture because this is one area where we have seen uh, in many developing countries that still rely on agriculture for livelihood, a huge market failure in terms of financial access. And there are reasons for that. Agriculture is risky um, and does need levels, varied levels of de-risking. But agriculture is also what feeds most of our people in some of our economies. So we cannot run away from it. And we cannot finance agriculture based on past experience because, as I've mentioned, some of these past experience were not particularly pleasant. So it's important as PDBs, as, as national development banks, that we play our role in financing agriculture and doing the hard things. Some of the messages that we managed to draw from the second finance in common in uh, Rome, and I'd like to summarize just four of them regarding the various sessions that I had the pleasure of attending um, that were co-hosted by CDP and IFAD, and of course under the leadership of finance in common, were well, around number one, our capacity to raise bundled products. I think a lot of focus has been placed on access to liquidity, which is important. But when it comes to agriculture, it's important that we think about our private sector in, in, in the form of bundled product. And what we mean is, yes, access to liquidity, but very importantly, the pricing of this liquidity. And I must say, in this struggle, it's important to remember that whether we are uh, all the members of the, of, of, the, of the finance in common share something in common. So we have uh, a shared journey with the, multi, the, the, the MDBs and the, and the national PDBs in the sense that we should focus on the quality of this liquidity in terms of pricing, in terms of tenor. Tenor is very important for the agriculture sector. Um, if you're going to finance tea, you must be willing to wait three years. Many commercial banks are not willing, but we need to understand the seasonality of what we're financing and make sure that we have products that match this seasonality. We also had a very good discussion around the guarantees and the de-risking instruments that often are not offered along with the liquidity, and it's important that we learn how to do that. And as we bank into the future, the capacity to also offer um, access to technology, modern practices in terms of sustainable development, and access to skills. And I, I must say that this is, this is probably um, 
single-handedly the biggest reasons why we were delighted by the launch of the platform that has been mentioned by Edama, because this platform will help us to have a safe space where we can discuss what works in agriculture financing, what doesn't work, learn from each other's experience, and have access to knowledge. So just my final point will really be around collaboration. And I know we've talked a lot about collaboration uh, across the board, but when it comes to agriculture financing, collaboration is particularly important to be able to, to collaborate with civil society, with NGOs that operate directly at the grassroots level, all the way to some of the big names that we all know who, who are MDBs in their various capitals and provide access to capital. So national development banks are, and, and regional development banks are very well placed to play in the middle section. So it was great to be able to meet all of us in Rome, um, thanks to Finance in Common, to have these hard conversations, and also to discuss what we've done wrong in the past and how we can make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Campeta, and uh, I, I like your words. We cannot run away as uh, public development banks, and we bank on the future, and especially for agriculture, the need to focus uh, on the quality of liquidity, um, to the risks, uh, to the risk, and to, to get access to technologies and to skills, uh, and of course to collaborate more uh, all, all together. Uh, thank you. I will uh, now turn to Søren Andersen. Uh, Søren, you are the general manager of EDFI, uh, the association of uh, European DFIs. Uh, could you please um, give us your perspective of the finance income common dynamics um, and especially the mobilization um, of EDFI on the climate finance, but of course the mobilization of, of private sector? Thank you. and to you and Patrick uh, for the first 10 years, actually in the course of which, uh, like Ubaldo also uh, mentioned, IDFC has been contributing very significantly to the confidence with which public development banks can, can be determined uh, today to, uh, to have a credible approach when it comes to uh, the green finance or the, or the climate mitigation finance. Um, and, um, and, and I think the work that, uh, that you have done in, in that area is a yardstick that that we can go by as public development banks when we um, when we look at the shared commitments within the financing common framework, um, like uh, Adama so well described, of our institutions to to double down on our commitments to uh, contribute to reaching the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement, but of course also the Sustainable Development Goals um, more broadly. And as you mentioned, Beril, I represent a group of uh, development finance institutions that are focused on uh, mobilizing the private sector uh, to reach uh, climate and development objectives, uh, financing enterprises and projects in the private sector, and mobilizing private capital towards emerging and developing uh, economies uh, by, uh, by deploying our catalytic public finance in the most uh, effective uh, possible way. And within the framework of the financing common uh, last year, uh, our institutions made a set of commitments to, uh, to align uh, with uh, our financing with the Paris Agreement in a credible way that could show the way for other uh, public development banks, but also for uh, private institutions. And part of that was, of course, to reinforce what we are doing to invest in um, in uh, green and in the decarbonization pathways for key sectors like uh, like the uh, ele electricity uh, uh, generation and, and service sector, uh, but also across a, another set of sectors. And, and we reinforce that uh, through a, a twin commitment to, um, uh, to commit to reaching a net zero by 2050 and aligning all our financing with uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and that was accompanied uh, with, um, with a set of uh, strong uh, fossil fuel exclusions and, um, and a commitment to uh, very strong transparency in the way that we go about our, uh, our work and that we make climate-related uh, financial disclosures. So we adopted the, the recommendations of the framework of the TCFD uh, to do that. Now, as, uh, as institutions, we, um, we, we need to play, as, as public uh, finance institutions, we need to play the catalytic role that many of the colleagues have talked about. 
uh, across a number of sectors and ensure that our investments are, uh, are climate smart. And it, it, um, it, it's uh, something that we have become very proficient at defining in, an, in some sectors, but still have quite a way to go in other sectors to know exactly uh, what that mean and how we can uh, say that what we finance is uh, well aligned with the relevant decarbonization uh, pathways of different sectors in di different uh, countries. And we need as public development banks to continue to work very closely together uh, to, uh, uh, to define that and to be able to lead the way in, in, uh, in different sectors. Uh, and so it's not just uh, something where we can flip a switch and say that, uh, that now our financing uh, is, uh, is, um, is uh, fully aligned with uh, the Paris Agreement. It's a journey that we're on uh, where, we need to, um, uh, where we need to work very closely together. I want to, um, I want to end by just observing uh, or linking um, uh, what we are doing on climate change uh, with the wider picture of uh, climate action. Because uh, we, need, we need to not just to finance the race to net zero, but also the race to, to uh, resilience. And um, and we know that uh, we know that um, uh, climate change is making our efforts to reach the sustainable development goals in many areas uh, more uh, more difficult. We uh, we need to double down on our efforts to secure uh, provision of, of electricity and power in uh, in settings where um, where that is uh, more challenging. Um, because we need to shift to renewables, we need to uh, make sure that we generate uh, decent employment in areas where uh, economic activity is challenged by climate change uh, due to the impact on agriculture and other sectors. And we need to, to double down to tackle uh, uh, gender equality to, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, because women are very uh, vulnerable uh, to climate change in, in, uh, in the most vulnerable settings. So we have a lot of uh, work to do ahead of us as development finance institutions, and uh, we are very determined to do that. And I know that let Laurie, who works for a partner institution uh, in Canada, is uh, going to speak uh, uh, next about the adaptation efforts that uh, are going on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Soren. And since we are running out of time, I will directly uh, turn to you, Laurie Kerr, your CEO of Indev Canada. Uh, and uh, since uh, Soren was, was speaking about adaptation, uh, please <laughs> uh, give you um, the progress made uh, by the Coalition on Adaptation and Resilience uh, since uh, uh, the first edition of uh, the Finance and Common Summit back in November 2020. Please. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to share the, the great progress that the uh, Adaptation and Resilience Investors uh, Collaborative has made over the, over the, the last uh, many months. So just for, comment, uh, just for context, last year, as was mentioned at the Finance and Commons Summit, um, CDC Group, uh, FCDO, uh, AFD and Proparco from France, uh, FMO, together with the Global Center on Adaptation, launched the Adaptation and Resilience Investors Collaborative. Um, since then, uh, many multilateral development banks, uh, development finance institutions, and public development banks have joined the efforts uh, going into top. There were going into COP. There were 14 entities. More have announced their uh, membership in the collaborative uh, at COP, so the membership is growing. Uh, Findus Canada joined the uh, collaborative in May of last year, along with the Development Finance Corporation of the U.S., as well as with uh, Italy's CDP. So a growing membership and, and lots of interest. Uh, the overall objective of the collaborative, as the name implies, is to really focus on uh, increasing investment and adaptation and resilience. And so that's the what, and I'll just spend a, a quick moment on, on talking about the how and, and what we've been doing over the last many months. So three working groups uh, have been uh, uh, put into place. Uh, the first working group is around on, is on metrics, uh, working towards standard uh, definitions and common practices uh, for identifying, measuring, and reporting on the contribution of adaptation and resilience to the objectives uh, that the group set forth. Um, this helps with uh, coming up with sort of common language in the adaptation and resilience space. So that first working group was on metrics. The second working group 
Group is on developing common approaches for uh, development finance institutions to better identify, assess, and mitigate physical climate risks in our own portfolios, as well as assisting our clients in understanding physical climate risks as it pertains to the investments that they're making. Um, the idea here is not to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of wonderful things going on in the adaptation and resilience space. So the, that working group is sort of inspired and building on uh, existing frameworks and tools that are, that are in the marketplace and adapting them to the development finance uh, universe. The third working group uh, is tackling the, the really big challenge of uh, finance and investment. The goal of this group is to tackle the gaps in increasing private sector investment in adaptation and resilience. And they're doing a couple of things by bringing together the, the multilaterals, the development finance institutions, and the public development banks. Um, we want to maximize synergies for co-financing and adaptation and resilience. But we're also looking at uh, coming up with uh, innovative, uh, structured solutions, uh, coming up with different types of uh, potential investment vehicles uh, to further mobilize private capital into adaptation and resilience. So overall, the Adaptation and Resilience Investment Collaborative is really a great forum for all of the public development banks, MDBs, and DFIs to work together to mobilize both public and private investment into adaptation and resilience. Thank you very much, uh, Laurie, uh, for the update on this coalition. And I will not, now turn to Anita Batia, uh, Deputy Executive Director for Coordination, Partnerships, Resources, and Sustainability at UN Women. Um, you, you would like to, to, to share with us the progress uh, made uh, by the coalition on gender equality and women's empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Good. Uh, so great to be with all of you, albeit virtually. Um, and let me start by also congratulating you and uh, Patrick on your anniversary and to say how delighted you and women is to be partnering with our co-chair um, AFD on the Coalition on Gender Equality, which of course was launched at the Finance and Commons Summit. Uh, last year. And, um, you know, we come to this work with a really um, a focus on the interlinkages between gender equality, finance, and climate change. And at the risk of repeating the obvious, let me just underscore that uh, women not only have been terribly disproportionately impacted by the last 18 months in the pandemic, but have historically and structurally been at the receiving end of the worst end of the stick when it comes to access to productive resources, as well as impacts of climate and environmental degradation. So we see this partnership as being absolutely crucial to achieving three things. First, really setting standards when it comes to ensuring that finance is recognizing the structural inequalities that women face and that uh, principles and standards for finance very explicitly take these circumstances into account. So we're really happy that we were able to launch, um, you know, the, the new document that we just have, which focuses on uh, having a gender lens in the operations of public development banks. And we see this as a really important step forward because although the world has been living with a number of standards, including the United Nations principles for responsible investment or the impact investment principles, which um, IFC led and which many members of the PDB coalition are signatories to, we have yet to see those really transformational changes when it comes to access to finance by and for women. So we see the standard setting role as very important. And of course, we're gonna to have to monitor how this is working, but it's a really important and uh, in our view, great uh, first step. So really happy to be able to work jointly with many of you to contribute to that. The second is, it is really important for us to think about new asset classes that actually directly reach women. So when you look at the world of ESG investing and you look at what Soren was saying about the catalytic role of development finance, 
it is really shocking when you look at how much finance is going directly to gender. There are a lot of other SDG goals but that have managed to attract uh, private finance, particularly health, for instance. But gender is conspicuous by its absence, actually, in ESG um, uh, investments. So one of the things that UN Women has been working on, and we're actually working with a number of countries on this, is to try to create what we hope will be the world's first sovereign gender bond. And we were very happy, actually, to see that JICA launched, um, I think, at the end of September, what is, is really the, probably the world's first sovereign gender bond. And while we have seen gender bonds being issued by corporates, we have not yet seen enough sovereign or sub-sovereign uh, investment that has a very specific gender lens. So we are actually working to create guidelines, which we will be launching um, the 16th of November with IFC and the International Capital Markets Association that will incentivize, we hope, more sovereign and sub-sovereign gender bonds. And then finally, I want to say something that is connected to this issue, but doesn't often come up in discussions of finance, and that is the whole issue of women's representation, leadership, and role in decision-making. It's very important for finance to consider to keep women in mind, but we also need women at the table. And decisions, whether it is on adaptation, decisions on climate finance, decisions on finance towards gender, unfortunately still suffer from a paucity of having women at the table. So one of the other things that we are working on uh, is the whole issue of women's leadership. And actually at COP26, we have launched, along with the Scottish government, the Glasgow Women's Leadership Statement on Gender Equality and Climate Change, because we want to keep bringing attention to the issue of how important it is to have women uh, in decision-making roles and in leadership roles. And I just want to leave a few factoids with you and our audience on this. So if you just look at the world of public decision-making, um, less than 10% of heads of state or heads of government are women. When you look at the 193 member states of the UN, only 13 governments have gender equal cabinets. And when you look at national legislators who control lots of our lives and lots of aspects of our lives, 25% only of national legislators worldwide are women. And finally, when you think of, uh, last factoid, when you think of how many task forces that have been set up across the world to deal with the effects of the pandemic, of all of these task forces, less than 10% of them have gender parity. So we have a long way to go to making sure that women are at the table in influencing outcomes that have an impact on women. And so for these three reasons, the standard setting role, the mobilization of more private finance towards gender-based lending, as well as uh, making sure women are at the table, UN Women is really pleased to be part of the finance and common movement. Back to you, thank you. Hearing you well, more women at the table. <laughs> Thank you. And then I will turn to Gilles. Uh, Gilles Kletz, um, you are the Director of Na Natural Resources at Agence Française de Développement. Um, biodiversity and, and water financing are key elements of the climate agenda. Um, so could you, could you yes, tell us what's happening in, in this funds? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Beryl, and, uh, and, and thank you for, for IDFC and for uh, the Finance in Common movement for this, uh, this occasion. Uh, what, what I would like to say is that um, subjects that have been historically um, least treated in the last 50 years somehow come to fruition uh, through the Finance in Common movement. 
uh, imbalances in power when it comes to gender or maybe to geographies as well, you know, come to the fore forefront. And I think it's, it's, it's key uh, to stress that uh, the, the, the mobilization of 10 or 13 percent of global investments through public finance institutions to redress these imbalances is something quite incredible, I think. It's a very powerful movement. And I would like to witness two key issues, biodiversity and water, that we've been working on very rapidly. We don't have much time. And I would like to address it as well from AFD's point of view, which is, has been declared last year a feminist development agency. So again, I think you know it's a, it's a, a, a sign of, uh, of times. On biodiversity, a, a long neglected subject that is absolutely key to solving the climate crisis, we have put together a coalition of, uh, uh, of about uh, 12 uh, members uh, within IDFC and then reaching out to the finance and common movement to produce standards, to produce safeguards, to produce methodologies to better uh, understand the risk associated, the financial risk associated with biodiversity and ecosystem degradation, very much linked to climate uh, evolution, and as well uh, uh, metrics to track biodiversity finance and to encourage nature-based solution with a different sector, such as water, sanitation, such as green cities, such as agroecology, such as ocean and forest sustainable management, for example. And this has proven a bit, as we've seen in other uh, subjects, the possibility to really share standards, improve practices, and progressively build a common agenda. And I think what is key with biodiversity, as with other subjects, and what is very rich within our members in the finance in common subject, is that these are financial institutions that are as well technical institutions and that have to reconcile the very complexity of dealing both with planet issues, climate and biodiversity and water, but as well inequity gender, social issues, and put all that together. And there are actually not that many institutions in the world that really have to address this complexity. On water, one of the great outcomes of Finance in Common uh, Summit number one and then number two is to have brought together a coalition um, of uh, uh, a bit more than 20 uh, public development banks who have been signatories of a declaration on the importance of water. You know that water, at least a quarter of humanity doesn't have access to proper water resources. Half of humanity doesn't have access to sanitation. I mean, in terms of gender impact and inequality, in terms of health, this is a, a, a hugely important sector. So this coalition has brought the possibility to better understand how to increase the mandates for water and sanitation, WASH issue as we call them, for public uh, development banks around the world, trying to increase their ability to finance the water sector at national level and as well to uh, better uh, um, leverage, of course, uh, private uh, finance when, uh, when adequate. So all together, and I'll conclude there, I think, uh, you know, water and biodiversity, but as well gender issues, agriculture and other are absolutely essential avenues, basically, for the, the sort of uh, uh, common role of PDBs and of the finance in common uh, movement. And I'm a very strong advocate that we don't only need carbon neutral, we need carbon neutral, nature positive, socially inclusive, gender sensitive uh, finance products. And public development banks are on their way through the finance in common movement to try to achieve this. It's not easy, but we are on, 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 on our way. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gilles. And uh, we are actually at the end of our event. I'm very sorry. Um, I, 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 I just want to, to take one minute to thank you all, uh, dear panelists, to, to thank uh, the audience online and here in, in Glasgow. And just uh, closing by, by saying, let's uh, continue the work. Uh, let's um, demonstrate uh, the role of uh, public development banks in reconciling uh, climate, uh, biodiversity, gender, uh, agriculture, 
uh, the private sector um, and reconciling uh, short-term needs with a long-term uh, transition. So um, all together, let's finance in common. Thank you very much.